Um, hi everyone. Um, welcome to the to the webinar on the environment impact assessment. Um, we have with us um, three panelists. They are from uh, the um, Consumer Citizen and Civic Action Group, a Chennai-based um, organization that works on citizen awareness and enhancing uh, citizen participation in governance. And they have extensively worked in the environmental area as well, uh, and have. A Sorry, Shita, I think you got muted. Yeah. Yeah. Now? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, and have worked extensively uh, in the area of uh, environmental um, issues. Um, they have a lot of expertise on something that we'll be um, touching upon today, which is the uh, environment impact ass assessment draft. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you, Shita. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, here are a few rules we would like everybody to keep in mind, just so that this is a fruitful and learning session for everybody. Please be respectful of each other. Please note that this webinar will be recorded. Please mute your microphones at all times. Event host will mute all microphones as and when required. Once one person speaks at a time. We will open for questions only after the speaker has concluded the session, but please feel free to type out your questions in the chat box here and the chat uh, monitor will uh, collate it and keep it ready for the question and answer session. In the interest of time, we may not be able to answer all questions. Uh, also in the spirit of a healthy learning experience, uh, the admin reserves the right to maintain decorum. If you have any feedback with regard to the webinar, uh, please reach out to us at info at jatka.org, uh, requesting uh, Nimisha to please type out that email on the chat box. As well. uh, all right, uh, we can move on to the next slide. Without further delay, let's get started uh, with the webinar, which will follow a format of 40 minutes of curated questions with the team at CAG, and the next 20 minutes of Q&A uh, from the participants. Akanksha, if you could tell us uh, what the environmental impact assessment is and uh, briefly also throw light on some of the industries that require this clearance. Over to you. Yes, Meghna. Firstly, I would like to uh, tell our audience uh, that in the era before India got its uh, independence in 1947, people were well aware of the conservation of nature. And uh, there were certain boundaries, not like the legal ones that we have right now, like environmental clearance and environmental impact assessment, uh, but there were cultural boundaries and respect for nature. Uh, we all must have heard from our grandparents uh, during childhood that we should not hurt trees and animals unnecessarily. So um, the concern for environment or nature was very organic initially. Uh, but when we started developing ourselves in terms of industries, uh, dams, highways, all our organic concern uh, that was hereditary has helped us to think in the favor of environment um, along with the lines of development. So coming to your question, um, in 1992... Akanksha, just a second, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you be a little louder? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, yeah, please. So in 1992, uh, is it fine now? Yes, much better. UN Conference on Environment and Development, which is also called Art Summit or Rio Declaration, uh, had come up with a, a document uh, with 27 agreeable principles uh, that indicated about sustainable development, environmental standards, environmental management and development. So basically the Rio Declaration was a seed from where the concept of EIA has originated. United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, um, is an international entity that has defined EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, as a tool uh, to identify environmental, social and economic impacts, which helps decide on the establishment of the proposed developmental activity. So Environmental Impact Assessment is an evaluation that is done to identify the likely impacts on the surrounding environment of the project proposed in any area. Also, it takes the queries or suggestions of people about the project during the public consultation meeting arranged by the project proponent that is to be resolved by the proponent. Based on that, the environmental appraisal committee 
takes its uh, decision on giving or not giving environmental clearance um, for uh, for a project that is coming up in their area. So uh, on 27th January 1994 um, was the very first time when environmental impact assessment came into existence in India, requiring prior environmental clearance for 29 categories of project and processes. Can you move to the next slide? So, and later in the uh, EIA uh, 2006 notification, these projects uh, were categorized based on their size and capacities as project A, which are examined by central government and project B, which are examined by state environmental impact assessment authority. So, uh, uh, as you can see here, these are all the major types of projects uh, which have uh, the potential to cause adverse impacts on environment from heavy projects uh, like mining, thermal and nuclear power plants to the township um, and hospitals, they require environmental clearance before their establishment. Um, and uh, or otherwise the proposal for construction of these projects will be canceled and such projects um, without any environmental clearance are illegal to initiate. Next slide, please. Um, the next question is, uh, which ministry or governing agency is responsible for the implementation of the EIA? MOEFs is the next slide. Please move. So MOEFCC, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, is the nodal ministry for notifying the environmental impact assessment notification, which is backed by our Environment Protection Act 1986. As I said, uh, the very first EIA notification had arisen in 1994. And the most recent one is the draft EIA 2020 notification, which is absurdly released during a uh, nationwide lockdown. Uh, Akanksha, if you could tell us the top line concerns of the draft EIA notification 2020, which just came out in uh, March. Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, Meghna, this is an interesting question. Uh, draft EIA 2020 has several dangerous loopholes. Like, um, it allows a post facto clearance to projects. That means a project already running, running without environmental clearance uh, can also be awarded environmental clearance. It was a temporary norm for some of the projects as per EIA 2017 notification, but draft EIA 2020 wants to make it permanent. To give you an example of how dangerous the post facto clearance is, the LG Polymer uh, uh, in Vishakhapatnam, which is owned by South Korean company LG Chem, um, which was um, uh, since 1978. So it was uh, recently in use due to leakage of styrene uh, gas and it has no environmental clearance till now. If such projects would be awarded an environmental clearance, any environmental damage caused by the project is likely to be waived off as the, um, the violation get legitimized. So you can think about how dangerous it would be. Further, as per draft EIA 2020, uh, the time period will be reduced from 30 days to only 20 days, time for the submission of public responses. Public hearings are no longer mandatory for several projects, which further weakens the public consultation for getting environmental clearance. Actually, um, the draft EIA 2020 is bypassing environmental impact assessment process. As per this draft, central government is getting power to categorize projects as strategic and no information related to such projects shall be placed in the public domain. And um, reporting of the violations would be done by violators themselves or by the government authority. So we as common people can, cannot uh, report a violation um, if we are affected by any project in our area. And uh, earlier, um, a new construction project up to 20,000 square uh, meter area required no environmental clearance, but draft EIA 2020 states that a project as large as 150,000 square meter area do not need detailed scrutiny by expert committee, 
nor do they need eia studies and exempted from public consultation usually after 6 months the compliance of a project with the permitted terms is mandatory to be reported to ease the burden of compliance for industries draft eia 2020 allows only annual reporting of the compliance which legitimizes the wrong doing by industries especially when we know that uh, there are so many old and inefficient uh, industries that are operational in our country irrigation projects that supply water to agricultural lands uh, by dam construction which leads to submergence of nearby areas and thus have a huge uh, environmental impact so draft eia 2020 states if such projects are larger than 2000 hectares only then it needs environmental clearance ironically most of the uh, irrigation projects in india is less than 2000 hectares only this draft eia 2020 is no doubt giving a free pass to such projects by setting up illogical standards let me show you the pictures of some recent incidents this uh, first picture is about the process uh, the protest for cutting down a uh, large number of trees uh, in ere forest by mumbai metro to construct a car shed area next one please this uh, second picture is showing the gas leakage uh, in lg pol polymer which has which was disastrous and has affected thousands of people in wisak to save the deng patkai uh, elephant reserve which is also called amazon of the east uh the college students in assam are protesting against coal mining project to prevent the destruction of this uh, biodiversity rich area so all these picture indicates exciting uh, sorry so all these pictures are indicating existing loopholes uh in eia and like an icing on the messy cake uh, the environmental uh, the ministry of environment now wants to impose draft eia 2020 as a environmental law for india so that's all from my side um we now come to a very crucial question uh, which is one of the reasons uh, this webinar also happened uh, why is the timing so important uh, for you know this draft law that was released um, you know in march and uh, initially they were inviting comments and suggestions from the public uh, until april but you know after a lot of um, protest and outrage uh, they have extended the deadline to june it's june 30th now uh, and you know this lockdown period as everyone's been home we've been seeing clean um, clean air and clear skies so um, we'll invite uh, neeraj now to talk about why the timing is so important compared to what we witnessed during the lockdown so oh, um this is um, obviously uh, this this explains why we uh, we're having this um, this session at this point uh, the eia 2020 um has been in the making for a while for more than a year now uh, they had the first version was released earlier last year which is called the zero draft where uh, comments from other states had been elicited and then for a few months there was absolutely um no uh, no announcement about it and now in in march in early march um, around i think the 12th or the 13th it was first put on the moef website that this was out for comments but this had not been notified and uh, and after it went notified got notified in the gazette it uh, it was published on the 23rd of march uh giving 60 days as is usual for any uh, pre legislative consultative process for the public to present their views on on a legislation that is being put up at this point so why is this timing crucial uh, everybody knows this um, no, nothing nothing new here that the next couple of days the nation went in a complete um, state of lockdown and um, and you know this has been like a daily battle that a lot of people have been fighting even for their most basic rights um there's been no access um for a lot of people to go to a government office and to access a draft we're still looking at a very small population that has access to the internet and that understands very well what the the new law proposes also very importantly a lot of times the government does not in itself take the the the, the role of explaining what the new law means to the people it's usually civil society organizations that sort of you know cobble up their resources and they try to do outreach in this space 
And for civil society organizations, for frontline activists, this has been an especially uh, troublesome time where our energies have been sort of divided on a lot of things. There's an issue with, uh, with migrant workers, there's an issue with ma making, making available basic resources to people in the time of a lockdown. So to bring out a law at this point, uh, to, uh, to, propose, to bring out a proposed draft at this point and to ask people for comments when there's no access for, to these resources, to read the law, to access it, to understand, to understand its implications. I think this is extremely um, discriminatory. Um, it's, um, it's, um, it's not accessible to everyone. And for that reason, um, it's important that this is, uh, that the extension has, it's good that the extension for, for comments has been made. But, uh, but we again need to see if this time is sufficient for us to still take this take this law, its ramifications to everybody who will be impacted. And, and the number of people who will be impacted by a law like this is, is huge because it covers a lot of industries spread across the length and breadth of the country. Uh, so why are, we demand, uh, why are we demanding that this notification be scrapped? Okay. So um, all of us understand that the EIA process um, works to try and let people know, try and let industries assess what damages they could cause to the environment and the people in its vicinity and try and then sufficiently make mitigation measures and then try and you know operate in a way that doesn't compromise the quality of the environment as much um, but it's a lot not a lot of people understand that the eia is not an act it's not the eia act it's the eia notification which has been issued under a parent legislation it's called the Environment Protection Act, which a lot of us are familiar with. This is a subordinate legislation. Um, I could tell you why it's, um, it's problematic that it's a subordinate legislation. It's because it doesn't have to go through both houses of the parliament and get their, their consent every time it is passed or it is amended. So, which means that uh, the EIA notification is, is made open to public comments. It's passed once, but after that, to make an amendment to it, it's very simple. You can either issue something as simple as an administrative order, like an OM, and just just sort of you know amend changes or make changes to the uh, to the to the legislation. Uh, a case in point is the EIA of 2006 itself. It was passed in 2006, but I think over two dozen changes have been made to it in the form of small, bigger amendments in the last 14 years. Um, and then the baffling timing, obviously, um, at the point that we just sort of uh, mentioned. Um, and then um, I think earlier um, uh, it was again mentioned as well that um, this very brief lockdown period has sort of shown how unsustainable our current uh, mechanism of operation has been. And the change that uh, the environment has seen ever since the lockdown has been significant. So uh, when you're bringing out a, um, you know, a draft EIA, especially in the time when you're looking at fast tracking clearances, what, what is the message that you're trying to say? First, you give a, first, there is a law which is not um, a law with full teeth in itself. It's a subordinate legislation. It can be amended several times and it's brought out at a time when we need a stronger environmental law, not the weaker one that we've been handed at this point. Okay, uh, can I ask you what a fair and just environment impact assessment law should look like? So, um, to start with, um, the first thing, the thing I've been saying so far, that it's a subordinate um, piece of legislation. It needs to be a law in the first place. Can you move a slide, please? Right. So um, what we need at this point is clearly a law which, which has teeth, which can be completely implemented with, with, full, uh, with full force. And uh, in terms of um, this, Always, there's always a, a dialogue that's happening. On one side, we're talking about how in the lockdown period, the environment, the quality of the environment has improved. And another point, we're still talking about how to sort of make, make do for the losses that we're, we're seeing at this point. We need to open up more industries, which we fear could be like a bigger dilution of the law. So the, the environment debate always on one side looks at the environment and on the other side, it looks at, um, at you know, uh, the economy. So to sort of do this balance, we need a more impartial environment regulatory authority, which can completely speak only for the environment as the law is supposed to be. Um, we need very strong uh, protection guidelines. One of the weakest links of the um, existing um, uh, draft, the notification, 
has been how compliance has been there how can we um, you know sort of how can once a project has been given a clearance how can we ensure that it operates within the boundaries that it does and what what happens to it if it doesn't um, so these are bigger questions that need to be answered uh, I'd like to also, uh, earlier in the conversation, I mentioned that the EIA had been put out to states last year, asking the state governments to sort of, you know, weigh in on the changes that had been proposed. Unfortunately, most of the opinions, most of the comments that the state governments had shared have been completely um, ignored in the draft that has, been that has been released in March this year, and that is out for comments at this point. So in a very, in a federal structure, it's, it's very important that states and their views are um, are sort of you know um, are consulted are taken seriously. It has to go beyond the tokenism of seeking their opinion and then not actually factoring it in. And um, penalty or or have guidelines in which um, the violation as uh, as I think Akuncha mentioned earlier. At this point, we're looking at legitimizing a violation, which is not actually any form of environmental protection because. The project could not have come in the first place if it had had uh, gone through a, a rigorous environmental impact assessment process. So we need stronger forms in which we, uh, we, we scrutinize project proposals that come in. And the EIA process has to stop being operating or stop operating as a license permitting organization. The law does not require all projects that are proposed to actually come up. Uh, there is an option of saying no to projects if they do not actually uh, pass muster. And I think that that provision needs to sort of be strengthened and there should be more respect for that. Um, again, to look at um, um, specific ecosystems and how within, within those spaces, how uh, they will need stronger environmental safeguards and not a, a, a more lax proposed law. So these are what uh, these are, I think, what make a, a environment, environment protection law stronger, or environment impact assessment law stronger. Thanks, um, Shalada. Uh, that was extremely informative and uh, quite interestingly. The next question is, uh, what role does the citizen play in this public consultation, and how much does an impact? I mean, how much do uh, how much of an in impact do they have in the decision making process? Okay. So um, the, the EIA process has six stages in the current law, even in, in, the current, in the proposed draft or even in the existing version. Uh, one important part of that was the public consultation process. So um, in a, um, as has been said enough, but uh, it, this really bears reiteration, um, this is very important for projects which have not come up yet. That's why the concept of prior clearance makes a lot of sense. Um, so what happens is that the company, uh, the, the company that proposes a project is supposed to do some, um, do studies, get some baseline data, have a sense of what the, the quality of the environment and the position where the, and the place where the project is proposed is, and then say how it will be impacted once the project comes. This usually comes through an accredited consultant organization, but the people that live in, the, in proximity to a plant or a, a proposed project will obviously have their, their livelihoods that change in several ways when a project comes there. Uh, so their concerns should also be fed into this environment impact assessment according to the EIA notification. So the public consultation is the, is the framework that is provided in which people who live around a proposed project can provide their, um, their concerns which have to be addressed by the project, by the company that proposes the project before it gets an environmental clearance. So it is an opportunity where they voice their concerns. Uh, again, we need to be careful. This is not limited to citizens, a non-Indian national, uh, um, uh, who, uh, someone who's not an Indian who is living around a, a proposed project. If he has a concern, he's also empowered in this law because he is also going to be impacted by it to voice his concerns. The forum that uh, their concerns are raised is called a public hearing. Apart from this, there is also a provision by which written responses can be sent. The email address or the and the address for the same will be provided when the public uh, when the project is open for public comments. Um, and um, this is not tokenistic alone. It is imperative that whatever the people raise is addressed by the company. Uh, it it uh, adopts suitable, adequate mitigation measures when operating a company and uh, a project and then submits all that says what it will do in response to the concerns raised by the public in what is called the final EIA report, the final environment impact assessment report. 
this has to be scrutinized by the uh, by the regulatory authority at the state or the center depending on which project it is and only if that is sufficient only if the people's concerns have been sufficiently um, um, managed the project can be awarded public uh, uh, environmental clearance so this is for the importance of the uh, the public consultation process um, just to sort of um, give an example it's a very important step and it is uh, the public consultation is usually the step that a lot of um, uh, that we see that elicits a lot of fear also when when it's a controversial project being proposed uh, an example would be the port expansion port redevelopment plans that were brought about in goa say 4 5 years ago um as a policy decision because um, okay so what happened was the idea was they wanted to redevelop the port in such a way that it could bring in more coal and to do the same they had to widen the navigation channels which would require more dredging which would in turn have an impact on the the fishermen and uh, and in general the air quality in the area so it sort of affected a lot of people in and around the space so um and since coal is in is especially a problematic material to be transported it has a lot of fugitive dust and things like that so um interestingly as a policy decision on an ad hoc basis this project had been exempted from public hearing and it had been awarded an environmental clearance the locals and the frontline activists in those areas took this to the green court the national green tribunal which quashed the environmental clearance which was given without because which was given because it was given without a public hearing and then the project had to go through the whole public hearing cycle again and then uh, there are a lot of provisions within the notification and through court judgments that sort of talk about how impartially and how um, the public hearing has to be a forum where people's opinion should be respected and should be um, you know should be sort of taken into view so based on this quite a few times the public hearings had to be cancelled because they had to happen in provision with the people um, the pro people provisions of the eia law and then the public hearings happened for these projects interestingly i think in recorded environmental history in the country the, this project had the longest public hearing i think it was 7 or 8 days on the trot um, i think public hearings were conducted for this project um and um according to newspaper reports none not one person spoke in favor of the project um unfortunately many years after that happened the project has finally been awarded an environmental clearance but we see that a lot of the conditions that come under the clearance uh, asking for compliance from the project proponent um it includes a lot of the concerns that people had raised so this is a very legitimate a very strong provision within the eia notification a very democratic uh, provision which allows for more people to air their views and for that to be taken seriously by the um, by the um, organizer by the company which ever is proposing the project sorry please go on okay um thanks for that sharda um the next question is around uh, the amendments that the moefcc has proposed uh, in this draft law do they apply only to existing industries or are they also applicable to the construction of new industries as well okay so the eia notification operates largely at least so far in the principle of the precautionary principle it says you don't have to wait for damage to happen as a precaution you try and assess the damages so all the projects that have been listed under the eia notification require prior environmental clearance which means before construction in fact there are very few activities that are allowed in a project land before an environmental clearance is obtained uh, these are basic things like fencing you know or or having uh, temporary hutments things like that so uh, the eia notification 2020 when it get when it gets passed so all uh, when once the 2020 um, draft gets notified all new projects will be will be awarded a clearance only under the uh, the 2020 draft however for to provide for a transitionary phase there are certain um, relaxations that the regulatory authority has been allowed to uh, to provide so when if it's an existing industry uh it will operate under the provisions of the law under which it was it was awarded clearance those clearance um, uh, the clearance document will provide the stipulations under which it will operate but all new industries will have to operate only under the 2020 draft once it gets notified 
if uh, any one of you can also give an overview in general of the fact that you know we've had all of these environmental laws in india and many of them have been amended in the past few years so within that purview um, the importance of the eia as a draft uh, notification and where that stands and you know the kind coming uh, circling back to why we're having the conversation about the eia today so to your question shikha uh, see eia is not a law it's a notification which the bureaucracy or the executive has the power to really i can be a babu sitting in my office and i as officer i will pass it off there is no debate before uh, this is uh, sent out as a gazetted notification and we have environment protection act we have forest rights act wildlife protection act there are many uh, intermixing factors or interdependent factors for a community living near a reserve forest where they also have their sacred grove and when i want to go and set up a industry there fri and all would take a back seat because i get the chance to operate directly through the eia notification and i can approach the forest ministry the environment ministry and all the concerned departments through the eia notification it's a notification which with the uh, its original intent was how do we balance the industrial development and growth and also environmental uh, protection and to answer in short it is uh, the operational aspect of elements under the environment protection act of elements uh, uh, under the forest rights act because uh, if uh, someone wants to set up an industry in a forest area then they have to take clearance from the forest department also the forest uh, uh, appraisal committee or the advisory committee and if uh, someone wants to set up a industry in coastal area then the coastal uh, zone regulatory uh, uh, notification the CR crg notification also would be applied so these notifications are basically the operational uh, aspects of how different aspects of this laws will be implemented on ground and how industries can basically come around the strict laws that we would have in environment protection or in forest rights or in wildlife protection dibang valley for example right now if you go purely by the wildlife protection act the etlin hydropower project might not really come up because there are almost 56% of the total bird species that we find in india are found in that uh, ecosystem there are tigers there are clouded leopards all these it's a biodiverse rich area and today it is world biodiversity day when we are having this conversation so if we go purely by that lens the project might never have seen the light of the day but eia notification and these provisions like those allow companies to try and uh, tread on the middle path uh, and try to balance industrial development and the ecological needs that's the intent yeah um thank you so much for that neeraj um we'll throw open the floor for questions now um we already um made a note of a few of the questions that people had put in um on the chat box uh please continue to um start i mean you can continue to keep putting the questions there um i'll start with a question from sohail who was asking if um anyone can please explain what a strategic project is uh which was something that was covered in the initial slide while talking about clearances so the bigger problem of that is that it's not been defined um the existing notification in all fairness even the 2006 notification says that projects which have a strategic uh, interest need uh, not have the public consultation process that is there so far in the 2006 notification but the 2020 draft weakens it further by saying any mention of that does not have to be there in public domain because it is a strategic interest so um the the question that the gentleman has asked is something that all of us are asking and all of us are a little concerned about because it doesn't have a definition and it's completely under the rug so to get any um it's it's possible that a lot of projects get couched that way and if it's not in the public domain our um our ability to understand which projects those are and to see what sort of a process goes into awarding clearances for the same it's completely opaque 
Thank you, Shada. Um, the next question is from Dave, uh, who is asking, I think, what all of us want to know, that what arguments does the government have for promoting such an amendment? So the problem with the such notifications, uh, according to rules, uh, there is a, a subcommittee which deals with the notifications that different ministries put out. And they are mandated that after a notification draft is put in the public domain, 60 days time is given for the public to respond. But there is no mention of what is the government's role there. Will it respond? It is entirely up to the discretion of the concerned ministry whether to go through the responses, whether to accommodate them, whether to uh, reject them. We can do only what we can, which is respond to the notifications. We'll never know what happened with it. What I can tell is this is the draft notification in the public domain. Before it comes out in the public domain, there is a consultation that happens between the central government and the state governments. And a zero draft in that matter of this 2020 notification was put out in 2019. And that was immediately uh, after the general elections that uh, this was done. And we obtained those uh, documents through RTI. We know that states had made some comments. If you compare the zero draft of 2019 and this draft 2020 notification, not a single comment from the states has been addressed or incorporated in the draft. The government has gone ahead with what it had originally put out in this draft notification and it is likely to go ahead with the same irrespective of how many responses they receive from the public at large or from different organizations. Um, to sort of just add to that, um, the one answer uh, for why the government, what rationale it has for pushing through a legislation like this is ease of doing business. Um, we are in the age where we have single window clearances for a company for it to make it to make it easy for a proponent to actually go through the clearance process without uh, without any um, any issues. I said earlier also that the uh, the regulatory authorities are being looked at uh, organizations that have to issue permits, so they're looking at fast tracking it, and you know how we can make it simpler for businesses to start for companies to start an industry. To sort of explain when the 2006 notification initially when the notification was passed. For a project to get an environmental clearance, it took nearly 640 days. Now we're talking about um, fast tracking it to the point where in 60 days a clearance is issued. So reducing the time for it compromises its quality, but its ease of doing business. That's one of the bigger um, arguments put in its favor. Uh, thank you, Sharda. Uh, the next question is from Mansi, um, who says that the draft EIA has been in the public domain for public, um, for, you know, comments from citizens. And as per process, the government is supposed to deal with all of those comments before it finalizes it. So what can we do to prevent this from becoming a law? Right against it. Um, that's the one line. It's out for public consultation. The process of a pre-legislative consultation like this, where laws have to be put out to, uh, for public comments, is for people to actively write against it. Um, so if you're invested in the environment, which I think all of us ought to be, um, don't just stop with writing about it. Please nudge a few others as well to write against it. Have smaller, um, if you're a student, please try and have more students invested in the cause. I think the one way uh, that we have at this point, uh, beyond everything else, is that the government is come and asked us for our opinion. Uh, our overwhelming dissent would be one way to sort of convey our unhappiness over it. So the one line thing is to write against it and to make a noise that you're not happy. Uh, to add to that, I would also say, even though it is not in the system of this notification, but it helps to let our elected representatives know that we are not happy about this. Make some noise, as Sharda suggested, by writing to the uh, uh, MOEF uh, in response to this notification, but also write to your elected representatives, MLAs, MPs, saying, hey boss, we are not happy with this. Tinkering with the environment. Ministers can come and say whatever they want, but they are really concerned about getting elected in every election. So if we really 
passed that message to the elected representatives that hey we are listening and we will be responding to whatever you do i'm sure moef uh, minister in future will refrain from saying coal is the king and stop supporting coal vidant is asking what will be the impact of the new eia notification if implemented on india's intended ndcs so uh, see ndcs are nationally determined targets that uh, india herself will set the targets for herself and uh, it's the government which will do so government will uh, still very well go ahead and satisfy the targets it has set for itself by saying we have set up x megawatt capacity or uh, x 1000 megawatt capacity of solar but we need to understand that something just having the name solar is not good huge solar mega parks which take up large portions of land which displace communities and grazing grounds of communities they can have problems with respect to people's livelihood getting affected their culture being disrupted the water balance in that region uh, uh, getting put up because maintenance of solar panels takes up lot of water what we need to understand is it is not okay for the government to go ahead with uh, such projects and we need to make sure that we convey our message that solar mega parks are not the way forward to meet our ndcs but rooftop solar and decentralization of energy i will take examples of energy uh domain that is the main domain we mainly work with so the case is decentralized energy is the way forward for energy security and not uh, going mega and the disease of uh, mega is something that our first prime minister shri jawaharlal nehru had realized even though he had embarked on it and he had put out a note in 1959 itself saying if we don't come out of this mindset of gentism it is going to disrupt the very social environmental and cultural fabric of our country and the ndcs might be very well satisfied through this route only building mega dams mega solar parks mega mega wind farms you name it there will be a mega version of it to really meet all the targets that we set under the ndc but that's not the right way uh, forward for anyone ankur is asking if any concerns and comments uh, were shared uh, by the states with the center and is it possible that the center did not include these in the current eia draft or did they publish it so um ankur um you probably joined us late i was uh, mentioning that the first draft a zero draft of the notification that's now out in public comments mm, it had been released earlier last year and um the states had to respond to the same so um most of the states um um responded uh, to such a call and uh, using rti this information had been um, accessed a lot of the states had uh, had taken exception to the provision of a district eia authority uh, which has been proposed in the current uh, draft it had earlier been brought into an amendment and i think the court um, stated it um so they had um, a lot of states like mizoram tamil nadu uttarakhand uh be had they had uh, written that you know they did not have the wherewithal for at a district level the expertise was not there to appraise really sensitive projects which could have a huge bearing on the environment even at the state level we are seeing the state eia authorities are not um, are not equipped to sort of take uh, make such decisions but to have it at the district level had been contested by a lot of states for different reasons they said they didn't have manpower they didn't have expertise or the capacity uh, to sort of look into these projects uh exemption of buildings up to uh, 50000 square meters that was again one of the things um that uh, i think tamil nadu had raised an objection to saying it would uh, sort of come in the way of their solid waste management uh, processes um and then the states had asked for um, also for more timelines for them to be able to respond to projects saying that the time that we have uh, under the new notification to scrutinize a project is very less um so these were some of the top line concerns and um, as both neeraj and i have um, have mentioned none of these concerns have been factored in in the draft that is now out for comments the whole uh, transition from zero draft to the final draft only has further steps to weaken than to actually taken the concerns that states have um, raised 
uh, on this, I'll actually jump to the next question uh, by Yogda, which is, uh, what is the weightage as per the present EIA, uh, not the new draft, on public consultation? Um, so, um, weightage, obviously not quantified, um, but uh, the existing law and the proposed um, notification specifies that um, all the material concerns have to be addressed. So it's not an option, it's mandatory that the concerns that the public raises is addressed by the regulatory, uh, by the project proponent. And it's uh, it's the duty of the regulatory uh, authority, be it the central government for the bigger, uh, the ministry for bigger projects or the state EIA authority for smaller projects. It's incumbent on them to um, ensure that these concerns have been addressed before awarding an environmental clearance. So that has not changed. There's no weightage in number, but it's mandatory that all the material concerns, material has not been defined, but all the significant concerns that the people raise will have to be addressed. Um, and Saram wants to know what measure or action is proposed in the 2020 amendment if the post facto EC cannot be awarded to a specific project, uh, will it be closed down? Okay. So um, here, this is called a violation. This comes under the category of a violation where a project, um, in my understanding of the question is, it doesn't have a clearance, but it is operating. Is that the understanding? So if um, that is the understanding, the regulatory authority is empowered to try and see if such a project cannot operate there. If it finds reasons upon inquiry that the project should not be operating, there is a provision for closing it down. But um, there are several provisions to legitimize it, either by making them pay a fine, doing more data studies, and uh, you know submitting a, a bank guarantee and taking up bigger management programs. So um, based on the experience of how violation cases have been handled, it is a very legitimate fear from for a lot of people that the violations uh, clause would be used more to legitimize than to close down uh, errant industries. Uh, Neeraj, do you want to add to that? What it is, and the very recent example is of LG Polymers case that uh, Akansha had mentioned. Because what happened is after the accident, the company went to the ministry and the expert appraisal committee, which looks into violations, had looked into it just on uh, 18th and 19th uh, of May. And uh, the decision is still pending. Also, because these projects come with a lot of investment, uh, it becomes fate a complete. You know, once the project has been instituted, even the courts we've seen that uh, the court, the uh, it's argued that you know, with so much of investment, the project has come up. How can we just close it down? And for that reason, they just given a few clearance uh, conditions, and they're allowed to operate. That will become more the norm than the exception if if this post facto approval is is sort of allowed. Nagendra has an interesting question, um, wants to know if production companies come from China to India due to COVID, uh, what about agricultural land and forests uh, and, you know, associated with pollution, uh, what role does EIA play then? Um, that's an interesting um, question, Nagendra. Um, I, can, I can speak as far as the EIA is concerned. Um, there, this project is going to be viewed as uh, as any other project that it comes from China. I don't um, unless there is a new um, there is any 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 such um, newer clarification on how industries from China will have to operate. I don't think that still matters because uh, if it's going to be a production company at the local space, I frankly I don't uh, seem to understand why China should come in the picture. Um, it will be scrutinized as any other project is. There's no um, clarity on that. Um, just the last two questions. Um, Avijit wants to know uh, what can citizens do to prevent this notification from coming into effect? I think, Shada, you sort of covered it a little bit in the previous I can I can add something to yeah. that. So in the light of uh, current tragedies uh, that have happened on 7th May, we all know, that uh, what happened the styrene gas leakage and all that so and the environmental restrictions that are happening uh, if the draft tia 2020 is enacted it will make a perfect uh, recipe for continuous environmental and public health disasters in india our current policies and uh, uh, laws ignore ecological concerns it suppresses the public uh, participation in decision making and are governed by profit making rather than inclusive growth. 
and the proposed ones are uh, uh, once they look at diluting uh, the laws further so uh, thus the public should raise their voices as uh, neeraj and uh, sharda have mentioned so public should uh, raise their voices against issues like in dpsc in uh, policies breach of environmental laws and delayed uh, environmental justice and we should demand for stringent actions against violators and should uh, demand for concrete environmental laws to manage and conserve our environment without any compromise in the name of money oriented development of our country i will quickly mention six or seven points which are specific points that uh, uh, people can uh, really try and uh, take action on those which is write emails or postcards to your local representatives which i already mentioned in that uh, letter that you write men, let them know how much you care for the environment and that you want your representative to speak on your behalf against such subordinate legislation and to let the central government know that even the elected representatives from states are saying that it's not okay for the center to really sidestep federalism and create such notifications which have a far reaching impact on india's environment and forest write to the cm of your state sign and share petitions like the one uh, we have created in partnership with jatka the link of which was shared in the chat box a uh, couple of times make this a mainstream issue by talking thankfully the media of late is playing uh, a positive role here because uh, stories related to environment have seen an increase in uh, the frequency in which they are published in the mainstream media in newspapers and i'm sure i hope that regional newspapers are also following the same but as citizens what we can also do is do chai pa charcha on environmental issues make this a mainstream issue by continually talking about it it could be a conversation over family dinner that if a patch of forest near our town disappears because of industry what will the future of water security or air quality in my town 10 years from now or 20 years from now try and think that way make it a common issue only then will real change come when everyone really understands that this is an issue which concerns us all because we all need clean air water and food for our survival and that is ensured only by protecting our environment and not by destroying it in name of industrialization uh gorov's question uh, which was already sort of covered in the beginning was um, what was the material difference between the 2020 draft and the existing rules um, on those aspects that are less beneficial to the environment uh, yeah sure so uh, what's the material difference between the draft and the existing rules yeah. especially for those that are less beneficial if you read the 2006 uh, EIA, which is the one uh, currently uh, in place, and this 2020 draft doesn't matter how much of an previous understanding you have or for uh, what is your background, whether you are an expert in this or not. The first feeling that you will get is the 2020 draft is more business friendly, and you have to really Type think here. hard. You really have to think hard to find. what are the aspects that are beneficial to the environment in the 2020 draft all the aspects that relate to conservation of environmental systems they are kind of considered as what it is and something that needs to be part of and something else brought in uh, which is the built environment to make life easy for the people and so we can go into details and uh, in each schedule where uh, details of industries are given and and starting from the definitions that are there we can go into the differences but the message that is there remains the same i can give an example which is the definition of what will be protected this notification will accept only those areas as eco sensitive areas which are notified so by moef 
if your grassland or if your sacred grove of forest near your village or if a patch of mangroves this is not protected or notified as a eco sensitive zone by the moef it will not be considered so by this notification and it will be considered as any normal piece of uh, land which is open to be used for other purposes also setting up industries setting up uh, uh, housing societies or educational institutes or anything doing any uh, economic or industrial development activity and this is one example i would give uh, where there is key material difference between the two notifications and uh, this draft in short just dilutes all the concerns that are there with respect to environmental benefits um to sort of just add to that if i can take a minute um um like it already mentioned to allow for districts to have an eia authority where projects that are seen as smaller projects can be appraised at that level instead of coming to the state level or to the central uh, to the to the moef that is a, a severely contested uh, pro, uh, provision in the zero uh, in the in the 2020 draft and um, a lot of um, leave has been given in terms of projects which are trying to modernize or expand their capacity you know up to a 50% expansion then you don't have to uh, um, you know sort of go through the whole rigor which was earlier a, a much more stringent uh, provision in the 20 uh, in the 2006 notification but it had later been sort of diluted in the uh, in the years that came and in the amendments that came in then um one of the thing is also about the lesser time um that has been given uh, for scrutinizing projects uh, operating it on a, on a very on a very tight leash so the clearances come in much faster which does not sort of allow a lot of time for uh, for scrutinizing them um likewise is also a provision where you know they modernizing if if a project uh, uh, is in terms uh, is you know uh, trying to modernize it can give out a list saying it is not changing its pollution load in which case it does not have to go through the whole eia process again and you know um, uh, in those areas there have been a few other um, relaxations that the 2020 draft offers also so the question had been how uh, from the 2006 um, law this is a weaker one um, i would also make the case that 14 years has passed and we should be pushing for a much stronger law but you know it's a bad law and you know making it much worse Yeah. that's the sort of the argument that uh, that seems to be happening at this point yeah i think that is the biggest takeaway um just the final question uh, from vartika it's um she had asked two questions one was basically that you know will the draft be implemented in spite of several loopholes but more importantly how can we save uh, the dahing patkai um uh, a uh, project where um, the minister prakash jawadekar on behalf of moef itself is promoting a coal mine so i wish i had a more optimistic answer to give uh, um, to this i i really do um i don't know the specifics uh, which stage of the clearance process the project you're talking about is in if there is um if um if which depending on which stage of appraisal it is in if there is um, a public hearing a public consultation there is some hope uh, from that obviously even otherwise there are um, clearance decisions which are taken to court which gets stayed multiple times as i mentioned even in goa it happened uh, the case that i was sort of talking about where clearances that have been unjustly provided have been um, have been revoked so uh, there is that sort of an option as well um is there another part of the question i didn't answer uh yeah that's about it the first part was just that uh, will it be implemented despite these loopholes which is i think a bigger question your guess is as good as mine really <laughs> i think i had answered that uh, previously and we are not very optimistic on that but finally uh, in the chat box i'm seeing a lot of comments which concerns this last question that you uh, put uh, shika which is uh, what can we do and really if we want to save projects so my main point is as one of the participant clearly pointed out how many battles can we fight it will exhaust the civil society so where should where should we direct our fight not at individual projects we might continue to do so but we should move a level up and focus on notifications like this which have a far reaching impact on all the projects across all the different geographies of our country and use the uh, steps that were uh, 
basically shared with you uh, with the, all of the participants uh, i request everyone to really do that make this a mainstream issue and something which is nothing short of a large scale social movement for the protection of our environment which is linked to our way of life and culture it is very difficult that anything else will be able to save we might achieve victories in one project but lose in another projects at the same time and that is not how it should be going ahead this also form my concluding remarks this were my concluding remarks as well yeah i was just about to say that i think making it dinner table conversation and expanding our own uh, this thing of how we talk to friends and acquaintances and family and what issues we speak about uh, creating more and more awareness um, sharda and akanksha any concluding remarks from you please take it past your um, your family please take it um, to social media outreaches to um, to wherever there is Uh, again i don't want to um, end on a note that says everything's gloom and doom um, the pre consultative legist the whole consultative process the idea of that is that the voices of the people the comments that they raise have to be factored in in the draft in the final notification that gets uh, that gets out uh, i don't want to talk about the history that we've seen with crz and everything you know how how our comments have been taken but i think a more systematic organization uh, um, you know campaigns like these that we're talking about uh these are really within our reach and there is a great opportunity to show um a strength in numbers so i would um sort of um urge for that i also agree with neeraj when he says than looking at it on a case to case basis uh this is one place where a lot of projects come together where a lot of the environmental wreckage that we are dealing with now could have been avoided so to that extent i think we should sort of show up strength at this point and um, and yeah that's that um thanks a lot chada akanksha do you have anything to add uh everyone should be uh should be more concerned about environment and uh, uh this awareness is a is the first uh, step uh in the uh process and uh if if you uh, aware more and more people about uh, what is going wrong and what uh, government the ministry is doing uh instead of saving environment they are going against of uh, it so all these things should be concerned as a uh, neeraj has mentioned uh, that uh, uh, we should do the conversation in our family with our relatives and all these things are very very important so yeah the, uh, we, should, we we should we should uh, raise our voices and we should uh, do whatever we can do from our sides uh yeah just taking a minute to thank sharada akanksha and uh, neeraj for this uh, wonderful session because the comments clearly reflect that a lot of uh, our questions have been answered and i think some amount of clarity has been achieved of course we will keep this conversation going and uh, yeah take it forward from there uh, a big thanks to everybody for joining us today uh, uh hope this has been a really informative and fruitful session uh thank you Thank you team um, Jasper we had a good time Thank you for watching our webinar please like subscribe or share our YouTube channel